So it had been a pretty long while, to my estimation, since I've done one of these Q&A videos for this channel. So I said, what the hell? Why not? Let's have at it. And that's what we're going to do here. Thanks to all of you that submitted your questions for the Q&A. I couldn't possibly get to all of them, nor was I going to. So tried to find some of the best, and let's see what we came up with here. All right? All right. If you want to follow the channel on Twitter, make sure you do so. Twitter handle in the description box, and that's where if you want to participate in future Q&As, you can submit your questions. Just Alex Central. He's good old. He's not Deluxe Man anymore. Deluxe Man Alex kicks us off by asking, considering all that's happened with CM Punk and the EVPs, do you think it's best for AEW to fire him or try to see if he, they can make amends? The answer to your question, Alex, is that I will have a video about this very topic uploaded Monday morning on this channel. And you will get all of my thoughts about the reports of CM Punk and potentially being bought out of his AEW contract and where I stand on that and where I think, what I think about that. So you will have to wait another day to get your answer. There we go. Very good. All right. I have a lot to say about it, as you can imagine. Koopa Kadev asks, who has had the better one-year run in AEW? Brian Danielson, CM Punk, or Adam Cole? You talk about disappointment, disappointment, disappointment. Like, none of those runs have been great, let's be very clear. But beyond question, the best of the three has to be Punk, doesn't it? He's at least gotten their world championship twice now, right? And he's been around for a little over a year and missed several months and yet was still able to do that. Meanwhile, I don't know what the hell they're doing with Brian Danielson. Adam Cole, give me a break. Yeah, it's got to be CM Punk. But honestly, Kubikadev, that really doesn't say much. I can't imagine looking at it any of the three of them, and said they've had a phenomenal first-year run in AEW. Unless you're the type that's like, hey, the only thing that matters is the matches. Then maybe you would say Brian Danielson, but look at where he's going. He's just toiling right now. Danielson's underscore 23 asks, did you get a chance to watch Ric Flair's last match? And if you did, what are your thoughts? No, I didn't. I'm not going to contribute to that tomfuckery. I know who the match was against. That would be yet another reason to not watch it because yet again, that slap nuts Memphis mid-card piece of crap isn't going to draw for me. So there you go. Um, but a guy in his 70s wrestling one more match, I have absolutely no appeal seeing that. There's no appeal to that to me at all. EJ Dennis 96. Thoughts on the Quincy Elliott character? I will be honest with you, I've paid very, very little attention to NXT. I've paid very, very little attention to wrestling Twitter. Maybe that's why I'm feeling good. I don't know. Um, I'm assuming he's some type of flamboyant character, but by the way, what I've seen, I guess, I don't really honestly know. Like, he's supposed to be a, a Velveteen Dream kind of replacement, at least in some type of way. I don't know. So the honest answer is, I don't know. I haven't paid enough attention to really care or be able to give a well-formulated opinion. So maybe I will do that and we'll see what I think. All right, next up, American Alucard asks, is Jericho winning the ROH title the final nail in the coffin for that company or the foreshadowing of a television deal? Honestly, it's got to be the foreshadowing of a television deal because there's got to be at least a little bit of an appeal if you're trying to get a TV deal and say, hey, the champion we're bringing with us is Chris Jericho. Like that, that carries some type of cachet, some type of sway, some type of pull and appeal. I'd have to think it's more of the latter than it is the former personally. Now, what do I think about him winning the title? I don't care. <laughs> like, it's whatever. They got too many damn belts they're trying to present on that show anyways. Um, but if you're trying to launch ROH on a new TV deal, like you could do worse than having Jericho as your first champion, right? In terms of just getting attention on your product. So it would be my thoughts. 
Jamie2788 asks, do you think there's anyone in AEW that has a crossover appeal? And to your credit, Jamie2788, I know you referenced a couple of names like uh, MJF and Jade Cargill, and those would certainly be two of them. I mean, obviously, you've got the young lions like Sting. He's obviously got crossover appeal. Uh, but if we're taking out the young lions and you're going with the grizzled veterans and the egomaniacs, like who has truly crossover appeal in that company? I think you called out Wardlow. There would be another one with some potential crossover appeal. Um, you know, maybe somebody like a powerhouse Hobbs or a Ricky Starks would be somebody that has crossover appeal. They, they do have some cats, I think, that have crossover appeal. MJF and Cargill would be the two that you would look at as being the most likely to have that type of crossover appeal. Um, whether any of them actually realizes that potential remains to be seen. Sbear504 asks, what's the major difference between Vince and Triple H? And I know you could go a lot of different ways in asking this question, a lot of different ways. I'm gonna go in one direction, and that is the single biggest difference is how much it means to each of them. And here's what I mean. Triple H clearly loves professional wrestling, clearly loves the WWE. It's in his, in his blood for the past couple of decades. Y you know that he's there for the long haul. Like he loves what he does. He loves the company, loves what they're about and all of that. The key distinction though is Vince was the unquestioned dude for over 40 years or 40 years, I should say. Like that was his baby. Bought it from his dad, made it. It's just different. No matter how much passion or love for it a Triple H could have, a Paul Levesque could have, he will never have the same feelings as a Vincent K. McMahon. And there's always, you talk about this in the corporate world, there's a difference when a company is run by the founder of the place. Now that could bring its own challenges with it, certainly, and it certainly did with WWE, but there's a difference there. There's a different buy-in, there's a different belief there. It's just different. So if I had to look, and you, you probably wanted me to go down the path of creative vision and direction and leadership and all those other things, I'm going more on this. That is the number one difference that you could point to. It means, it meant more to Vince than it ever possibly could Triple H. That's just a reality. Tamiba2 asks, is Drew McIntyre the greatest British wrestler of all time? Is he? Is he? I don't know about all that. Pretty good. I'm sure Billy Robinson or somebody else would have something to say about it. Does it matter? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Best Buy Rick one asks, how good is the My World podcast and This is how your question should have went. Best Buy Rick One. Hello, my name is Best Buy Rick One. And I am a fucking piece of crap. Jeff, Schlag Daddy, could you tell me how much I suck? Gladly! You suck! because you always try to squeeze in these questions about that guitar break and no dime draw on Memphis mid-time piece of crap is trying to squeeze in eventually something about his horse face bitch of a wife. Me, me. No. How many episodes do you think I listen to? Seriously. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Raiden Xerox asks, is the House of Black buried? Well, they sure as fuck aren't elevated, are they? Oh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Black is going to go there. He's going to do phenomenal things. Shut up, people. Now, you really think Tony Khan is that great in terms of knowing how to get the best out of all of his talent? No, I don't think so. Come on now. That's not his game. That's not his hustle. That's not what he knows. So was the House of Black buried? Of course they're fucking buried. Alistair Black asking for his release, and you remember the the reaction on the internet of, well, no, he didn't ask for his release, and then you find out later, oh, yes, he did, but you know those same people 
that sat there and tried to say that he didn't now, of course, are magically very silent about how wrong they were. That's typical. Um, but yeah, they're Barry, dude. Flat out Barry. Corliss Rush Jr. When, if Cody wins the title, is that a thank you from God for leaving AEW? Um, I guess it'd be less about that, more about they want to get the strap off of Roman. I want to be very clear here. Cody should not be the guy to beat Roman. And that has nothing to do about how I feel about Cody. That's just, you've gotten to a point with Roman that the person that needs to beat him is the person that's going to be the dude for the next 8 to 10 years. Cody's not that guy. Right? I'm not crazy for saying that, am I? I wouldn't think so. You need to, it needs to be some type of young lion that's going to be the face of the place for the next 8 to 10 years. And not a young lion like The Rock necessarily, but like a, a, a different young lion. Like you got to get somebody like a Braun Breaker or somebody ready. That is who needs to beat Roman Reigns. Otherwise, you come up with an excuse for him to vacate the title and nobody beats him. It, it shouldn't be Cody, though. I really don't think it should be. It may very well end up being, but I think that's a mistake if they do. Demarcus Flowers asks, How hot happy are you that Sami Zayn is getting over with this character tremendously? Because you point out, like, I used to be pretty critical of him. Absolutely. This fucking El Generico was dumb as shit. And his early work in NXT and WWE did not impress me. But the dude, similar to, like, Daniel Bryan, who I was absolutely not big on at all early on in his NXT WWE run. Like, I saw a guy that worked to become more well-rounded, that embraced the performance and character and storytelling elements to become a really well-rounded performer. Hell, so hell yeah. Like he's honorary oos number one for a reason. He fucking deserves that spot. This dude goes out there and gets it done. And in more than one way. So yeah, I'm very happy about it. I want to see more talents be like that. Mo Benny 99 do you think Amos will ever get the hang of wrestling or will it never work for him? I, I certainly would put my money on the second part right now. I just can't see how it will ever work for him. I don't. Cabron James 22, do you think Triple H's recent booking since taking over a head of creative is overrated? Um, like how, how great are people making it out to be? I haven't watched much of the product recently. Uh, but I can assure you, if they're singing the praises of it, yeah, then it's overrated. Rick Styles, 1985. Do you think Mandy Rose is the most improved superstar in NXT, and should she come back to the main roster and win the Rumble? I don't watch NXT. Certainly seems like when I see clips and highlights, and I see like Twitter posts, like it seems like she's improved. I mean, she's still smoking hot, obviously, maybe hotter now. Um, should she come back to the rain roster? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe she serves a better purpose for them right now in NXT. Mr. D. Archer. When did pro wrestling change to where it was more about the match quality than the personality and the storylines? Um, you've always had that undercurrent, that segment of the pro wrestling fan base that cared about that above all else. But what happened was over the past two plus decades, as the casual fans started to leave and the more hardcore fans stayed, they became a larger, more pronounced portion of the wrestling fan base to the point where they overpowered it. So it has been a slow transition. You can't blame any one person as much as I would love to blame a Dave, Dave Meltzer. I can't. Because it's not just him. Like It is representative of a shift in demographics of the fan base and the types of fans that you have left. So it was eventually going to happen. But it's been a long process over a long period of time. Keys 10 asks, as of right now, who's winning the Royal Rumble? That is a fantastic effing question that I do not have the answer to. Like, is Cody going to be back in time for the Rumble? Certainly seems like if he would be, he'd be an early on's on favorite. But at this point in time, you might as well bring the Rock back, have him win the Rumble, so that way he could take on Roman at Mania. Let's go with them young lions and let them roar! KOG715, who would go over in the Ultimate Survivor Series Dream Match of the AEW's Young Lions versus WWE's Breakfast Club. All right, so let's look at who would be some of those Young Lions. You'd have Sting, you'd have Billy Gunn, you'd have Christian Cage. That's a good roster, good list. Yeah, the Young Guns, at least for now, the CM Punks and the Daniel Bryans. 
I think it's a pretty impressive roster of young lions hungry and ready in the peak of their lives and their careers. But we're talking about the fucking breakfast club. The breakfast club. They got God on their side. Not only that, God is literally bucking the territory. So of course the breakfast club's going over. How is this even a goddamn question? <laughs> oh, God. All right, Jay Saluka, what do you got for me this time? More whining about Roman? No, I censored out that question. We won't include that here. Uh, just repeat. Uh, but Sinner51190, James, does ask a different question. This is an interesting one. What program that we did not get do you think would have been more interesting and compelling to watch from a storytelling standpoint? Kevin Owens versus Brock Lesnar or Bray Wyatt versus CM Punk? I'll be on question, Bray Wyatt versus CM Punk. And especially if you would have been able to get the stars to align, like you could have done the Wyatt family versus the Straight Edge Society. Like the timelines are off and everything, but if you could have gotten them to line up, you could have gotten them to be there at the same time. Like that's where the bigger money spot was to be, would be Bray Wyatt versus CM Punk as an extension of a larger Bray a Wyatt family versus Straight Edge Society feud. That would be freaking phenomenal. Kevin Owens versus Brock Lesnar, no, I wouldn't take that particularly seriously. So I don't think, storytelling-wise, that that would have been all that interesting to me. But I think Bray Wyatt versus CM Punk, Wyatt Family versus Straight Edge Society, if you could have worked it out that way, would have been phenomenal. Canadian C273 closes us out by asking, does the recent CM Punk news change your opinion on the 2011 Pipe Bomb promo? I'm trying to figure out what you mean by this one. Canadian citizen, what are you talking about, you mother canucker? No, I, I don't really know what you're getting at here. Like, have I changed my views in terms of CM Punk being a crybaby? No, he's always fucking been one. Of him being an egomaniac? No, he's always fucking been one. Like, where's where's everybody been the past decade plus? Um, like, is it still a great promo? Sure. Does that reek of hypocrisy? It, it did back then. Are you talking about? You know, you do going from waving and saying hi, Colt, to now he's crapping on Colt Cabana and potentially fumbling his bag over goddamn Scott Colton. Yeah, just weird. Um, I don't think it changes. It, it doesn't really change the way I look at that promo. So maybe you could clarify what you mean, because otherwise I'm not really sure I'm not that I'm following here. Um, but that's it for this Q&A. Thanks to all of you that submitted your questions. I did have fun flying through these. Got through a number of them in under 20 minutes, so I'll take that. Make sure you smash that like button. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. And there, there you go. Make sure you check it out tomorrow, my video about the CM Punk contract buyout rumors with AEW. Shall be interesting.